actually do a tasting, and they tasted the duck, and they said, according to Schumer, it just wasn't was kind of gross. <laughs> so they decided well, to, to go do a, a to, to bison. Let's listen. Okay, Mr. President. I supposed to do. Ladies and gentlemen, please sit, please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, honored guests, my colleagues on the Joint Congressional Committee on Inaugural Ceremonies and I are pleased to welcome you to today's inaugural luncheon. In this historic room, we look around at the 35 statues representing men and women. Well, one woman. Thank you, Illinois and Senator Durbin, for the statue of Frances Willard, though I feel obligated to note that she was born in Rochester, New York. <laughs> Thankfully, she will soon have company when Rosa Parks completes her journey from the back of the bus to the front of Statuary Hall later this year. Now we look around and remember the men and women who helped define our nation. They, like us, faced obstacles, and they, like us, worked hard to move this country forward. Here in this hall, four presidents took the oath of office. Here, Abraham Lincoln served his single term in Congress, and John Quincy Adams, the only former president to return to serve in the House, spoke out against slavery. Today, we also remember an event that took place outside this building, but reverberated within. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s March on Washington, which spurred passage of the historic civil rights laws. We're honored to have with us a colleague, Congressman John Lewis, who was a speaker at that historic march. <laughs> Congressman Lewis's life exemplifies the courage and sacrifice that have made our nation great. John, please stand and take a bow so we all can recognize you. <laughs> Behind us, the painting we have chosen for this luncheon is Niagara Falls, painted in 1856 by Ferdinand Richard. For me, as a New Yorker, Niagara Falls never fails to inspire a tremendous awe for the natural beauty of our great country. Then and now, the mighty falls symbolize the grandeur, power, and possibility of America. And I want to thank my former Sen Senate partner, our great Secretary of State, Hillary Rodham Clinton, for allowing us to borrow this beautiful painting from the State Department collection. But frankly, we aren't here for the paintings, we're here for the food. And while the theme of today's ceremony is faith in America's future, today's menu could be labeled faith in America's food. From the New England lobster, to the heirloom vegetables, to the South Dakota bison, to the wonderful New York wines, each element was carefully chosen and expertly prepared. It was actually chosen by the tasting committee, which consisted of Debbie Boehner, Landra Reed, Diana Cantor, Paul Pelosi, Honey Alexander, and my wife, Iris. They did a great effort, they did a great job, and the effort was truly bipartisan. 
So if you don't like the food, you can't blame it on one party or the other. But I know that won't happen. I know you'll enjoy it. Before we begin, it is my privilege to ask the Reverend Luis Cortez, Jr., President of Esperanza, to deliver the invocation, after which lunch will be served. Please rise. Let us join together in prayer. Dear God, in this room stand women and men of differing beliefs, different understandings of how you reveal yourself, how you reveal your will and your desire to us. Yet at this moment, our nation joins with us in prayer and supplication that despite political differences within these chambers, and despite the fact that at times we may take for granted things that are unique to our American democracy, that we be united in hope and aspiration for the future of our nation. We prayed for continued freedom, freedom to pursue happiness, freedom to create goodness, freedom to preserve the common good. We pray for continued liberty, liberty to preserve our rights, liberty to defend our understanding of good, liberty to develop ourselves fully as you would have us. Our nation prays with us as we ask that our leaders be endowed with wisdom, that they may know on which path they should move our nation, with courage that they may go against their own when necessary for the common good of our beloved America, with resolve that they not tire but move unrelenting towards that common good. We pray a blessing on our House of Representatives, on our Senate, and our, and our judicial and executive branches. Bestow on every member spiritual protection and good health. We uphold President Barack Obama and his family in the same manner. We are thankful for the religious freedom of this nation, for our family and friends, and for this meal which we will now share, remembering that there are still those who suffer hunger in our nation. We have all joined in this prayer in our particular God's name, and I, in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. Be seated and enjoy lunch. The lunch, uh, the cameras will go down for. It's uh, the rest of the lunch is not uh, not televised, so uh, we continue to broadcast here from the National Mall. The National Mall is really uh, is kind of thinning out very quickly. Most of the crowds are trying to. I guess grab some food maybe and then try to get a, a spot along the parade route. But um, if you're watching at home or wherever you may be watching, you've got the best vantage point. We have our correspondents and cameras all across the, all along the parade route. We're going to uh, be following it every step of the way, of course. Uh, looking forward to that. Um, there, one of the things in which uh, the one of the things the president talked about, in, and there you see some of the crowd uh, still. Uh, very excited to be here, but they have not obviously made their way to programs there yet. Uh, one of the things the president did talk about was was a time to stop name calling and and and, and work together with Congress. Let's play part of the, of that speech. For now, decisions are upon us, and we cannot afford delay. We cannot mistake absolutism for principle, or substitute spectacle for politics, or treat name calling as reasoned debate. Name calling is reason to be junking. Do you think that actually resonates, or, or is is that what Paul Begala said, which is kind of pay lip service to bipartisanship and then go out and be tough and ruthless? Well, the 99.9% .9 of Americans who live outside of Washington who don't work in politics will say amen, and they hope he means it. Uh, and, and I don't say that to be cynical. I say that because there are some people out there who would blame the president and the Democrats just as much as they would blame the Republicans. Now, a Democrat out there right now is saying, no, the Republicans are more responsible, and a Republican out there is saying, no, the Democrats. This is the fight that has paralyzed this city, not just for the past four years. Uh, we went through some of this in the Bush administration. We went through some of this in the Clinton administration. We 
can trace some of it back to the Washington and Adams and you know Madison administrations. But in recent times, things have been so petty that this town often resembles more a daycare center uh, than than an operational cooperative adult government. And so I think the president's trying to make a point. Uh, he's going to have to follow through because he and his lieutenants have done this at times too. And again, we've talked about the issues he talked about. They're heavy lifts. And he's a if he's asking the Republican base to do immigration, that's going to cause internal friction in the Republican Party. When he asks them to do, if he asks Democrats to do entitlements, it's going to cause internal friction in his party. That's when the name calling starts. Uh, will he step out and try to stop it? But here's the here's the rest of that paragraph. He says we must act, but we know our work will be imperfect, and we're not going to get everything we want. So what he is essentially saying is, okay. We've got to act on gun control. Maybe we won't get 100% of it, but we we kind of have to try and do and get done what we can get done. And he said, you know, um, we must act knowing that today's victories will only be partial. Mm. So there's a bit more realism, I think, uh, in this president saying, I'm going to start the fight, and I, I may not get everything I want. Um, you know, for me, I feel like, one of the things he was trying to achieve at the level of values, you know, we've talked a little bit about some of the policies, some of the policy fights, we know they're going to be tough, but there is a tug of war happening in this country over the meaning of patriotism itself. Who are the patriots? Are the patriots the people who are, who are challenging the president and saying that he's not even born here? There's, that's a form of patriotism. I think what he really did, he laid down some pillars here for a new kind of patriotism, where when you invoke America's values, you include everybody, Alex talked about equality. I do think he was trying to deepen that, that commitment. I also think what's extraordinary is the embrace of Dr. King, almost as a second uh, founder. It, 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 when, if, you, if, if you really know Dr. King's story and how vilified and reviled he was when he was alive, he was not a celebrated person. He was considered a gadfly. Even the New York Times backed away from him the last years of his life because of his stand on the war, because of his stand against poverty. For him now to be embraced, I, I think Dr. King was mentioned more than, than George Washington um, over the past couple of days. That is an extraordinary achievement. And now I think this president wants to see more people included in the same way um, for, for the Latino community, et cetera. And, and that is, I think, the importance of this speech to his base. And again, his base is a rainbow coalition that is now the governing coalition in this country, and it includes a lot of people who have yet to feel the embrace we now see with Dr. King. Many people watch uh, this day uh, for, for politics, others for, for personalities, in particular Michelle Obama and, and what she is wearing, what the kids are wearing. Alina Cho is joining us with some information on, on I guess, some of what uh, uh, Michelle Obama, the first lady, was wearing. Alina? Hey there, Anderson, and I'm sitting here next to Tim Gunn, who is, of course, a noted fashion consultant and judge on Project Runway. Uh, the coat and dress that Michelle Obama wore to the inauguration morning uh, was designed by American designer Tom Brown. He is uh, from Allentown, Pennsylvania, started his label way back in 2001 with just five suits and by appointment only. I caught up with him recently uh, at his uh, studio in Paris, actually just this morning. Uh, he had just shown his men's collection. And that is significant because he told me that the fabric that was used for this outfit was based, developed on men's silk ties. He told me at moments like this, he's really at a loss for words. Let's listen to what he told me. Were you nervous? I'm nervous now. <laughs> I'm nervous. That, you know, you know how sometimes you get so excited and so, you know, overwhelmed that you, you know, I'm somewhat nervous just talking to you about it now because you can't really put it into words on you know how it feels but because I even just saw her walking in um, just that second and she looks amazing she's been so supportive of all of us um, particularly American designers and she has an amazing style and just always looks so good in whatever she chooses and she um, she just has great taste you know, one quick note, Tim, that uh, Tom also told me was that he, he chose that navy specifically because he was mindful that the president might wear navy. And, and, she, and he wanted to make sure that she looked good next to him. So in your estimation, how did she look? Well, on a scale of 1 to 10, I give her a 100. Ugh. She looked absolutely fantastic, the really fit radiant. Was, it really comes down to beautiful. the fit, doesn't absolutely it? Absolutely beautiful. Now, what about the dress? Because we just got a first uh, glimpse at the dress just a few moments well, ago. Yes, for the first time, because I, I've only had only 
seen her in the coat up until that moment. I have to say, when she belted the coat and it and gave it more proportion. J. Crew belt. Yes, beautiful J. Crew belt. I, I loved the coat even more. And I have to say, I do love the dress. I've had to wrap my brain around how different it looks without having the coat over it. But Mrs. Obama is nothing if not a fashion icon, and she has a radiance about her that is captivating. I think what's also important to point out is that she's a real woman. I yes. mean, this blue cardigan she's wearing is made by another American designer,